Hello, 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 hello. Welcome to the U.S. Rowing Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion web monthly webinar. I'm Richard Butler. I'm the co-chair of the U.S. Rowing Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion um, Committee. And I am so glad to see 200 plus people decided this is an important topic. Uh, we are here because in 2020, uh, a lot of tragic things happened in America and uh, Mr. Floyd died, Brianna Taylor died, and rowing clubs throughout America decided that they wanted to do, do better, to be more inclusive. And so we are here today not to solve your DEI problems, but to talk in general about some things that you can do and some things we're gonna tell you, you're gonna step in it, don't ever do that. And we're gonna have fun with it, we're gonna be creative. Uh, we're gonna talk with our panelists in a moment uh, for about 20 to 30 minutes, and then we're gonna open it up in the chat for all of you. And the way that the chat is going to work, and I'll remind you in 30 minutes, the chat is gonna work this way. You will say that you would like to speak, and then we will call out your chat in order, uh, especially if it's relevant to the conversation. Uh, again, we are not here to solve racism, nor to solve your problems, but we're because we're part of society, we need to have this conversation. I also wanna give a shout out to Pride Month. Pride Month is more than a month for me. It's every day of the year, but for our LGBTQ plus community that's on this webinar today, shout out to you. Thank you for all that you do for a rowing community. And a small story, when I, I was, I'm the former inclusion manager for US Rowing. And when I first got the job, the DC Strokes, out of Washington, DC, were the first rowing program to contact me. And that's significant because they are, our, I believe, our first LGBT rowing program. And they reached out to me and they invited me to DC and we had a wonderful conversation. And I said, oh, right now you're not a minority in general because you're more of you than anyone else in the sport of rowing. So shout out to DC Strokes. I saw that some of you signed up. So I would like to start by introducing each panelist individually and jumping right in with some exciting, super fun questions. Um, uh, but one more thing, I've stolen this from Lululemon. Once we get into the question and answer, if you take space, make space. Thank you. So I would like to introduce our first panelist, a, a friend of mine since I stepped foot into U.S. Rowing as in an inclusion manager role, Dr. Withycombe. Raise your hand, Dr. Withycombe. And she has been a colleague and an ally, and she has stepped in it and been around it and throughout uh, U.S. Rowing as well as uh, throughout the country. Uh, I, I love her one claim to fame that she may not talk about, uh, but that she was the DE&I consultant for the NCAA. And so there's a, there's a whole lot of conversations. That's probably a, another uh, webinar that we'll talk about with that. And so I'm gonna give you Dr. Withycombe's bio, not all of it, but ones that's important to me. So Dr. Jenny Lynn Withycombe is presently the program administrator for health and adaptive physical education in the Portland Public Schools. She has over 25 years experience within the field of sport and physical activity as an athlete, coach, consultant, professor, and diversity and inclusion educator. Dr. Withycombe is responsible for, ins for ensuring quality, inclusive health and adaptive physical education implementation in a safe and welcoming environment for over 50,000 Portland public schools, K through 12 students. She is the manager for the Portland Public Schools, and more importantly, she's the manager of the ERC Ed program, which operates in three high schools and four middle schools across the district. In addition to her, her district work, Dr. Withycombe is the CEO of Withycombe Consulting, a company through which she conducts workshops, talks, and planning sessions on the issues of diversity, equity, and inclusion within educational institutions and sport. Through her teaching and consulting practice, Dr. Withycombe helps participants understand and develop a cultural consciousness around sport and physical, physical activity, a skill vital to educational and athletic institutions for sustaining growth and change. And one big call out, Dr. Withycombe is a rower and her most special gold medal, although she has many, K-12 
came from stroking the 2013 hit of Charles Mix Quad. I would like to welcome Dr. Withycombe and thank you for being part of the panel discussion. Thank you, Richard. I'm very glad to be here. And it's it's right there behind me. So. The medal is behind you. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. So your very first question to get us started. Um, why is DEI so important in sports? Right? Um, Low hanging fruit. Right. I think someone's written a dissertation on that. You? Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, I think, um, you know, I was not able to participate in sports until I was uh, 16. So uh, we just, we didn't have the money for me to participate in um you know, community programs. So my only experience with sport and physical education was what we got in, in school. And, um, and when I, when I joined sports, there really, there wasn't a lot I could join at 16 years old that, you know, most kids had been participating for years and I was, you know, 5'11 and awkward. And, uh, and so it's no wonder, right, that I fell into rowing. But, um, but I think when I joined sport, I felt like everything for me changed. And that is something that I think everybody should have access to. And it wasn't just like my, my physical health changed, but my emotional health, my social health, my spiritual health, everything shifted. And it was, I used to tease um, my novice rowers that um, rowing made me awesome. And it was, it was in every sense of the word. And that is something that, that needs to be accessible to everyone. The, the first time I looked at sport, I was thinking about how can we use sport to shift society? You know, we always say that society is a reflection of sport, but why couldn't we use sport to change the way we do things in our world? And whether that is looking at race or gender or sexuality or culture, or class, um, religion, um, there, we can be thoughtful about the way we engage in sport and physical pursuits uh, to shift the way society you know, operates. And I think so many people, sport is a taken for granted um, aspect. It's also a very accessible aspect of our lives. And so we can have really tough conversations through the sporting lens and, and really shift um, larger narratives. And so um, you know, yes, you know, the more diversity we have in sport, the more successful we're going to be, the, you know, the, the higher caliber athlete we're going to turn out. But, but for me, it's, it's more than that. It's, it's really at a level of just shifting the world as we know it um, towards something that is more inclusive and more equitable and in every sense of the word. That's really cool story. Thank you for sharing that. I always like to point out that in sport, the people participating in the sports is part of the, a part of society. And so we can't just think that we walked onto that field or onto those docks and society isn't happening. Society is within your sport. And that's another reason to embrace diversity, equity, inclusion, and even belonging. Another question I have for you, uh, Dr. Withycombe, you know, this, this, the title of this is the do's and don'ts of creating a diverse and inclusive organization. And Jenny Boss says, we, like, we don't need checklists, but you know what? We're going to pretend like there's no checklist. And so I was curious if you had a funny story about a don't in your work as a consultant, uh, in your own rowing program, or just in life. And you can have, give me, you can give us more than one. Because I know um, there's more than one. <laughs> <so many. laughs> um, I I will say that, that most of my funny stories are um, they're they're on that borderline of funny and sad, right? Which is that while they're amusing um, as as my journey has gone, um, you know, it it just they they have often served as reminders of how badly we want to do better and how easy it is to. To, to do one of the don'ts. Um, and, and even with the work that I've done for so many years, I will step, as you said, step in it, right? We, we all will step in it. We're always, uh, a colleague of mine mentioned, we're always toiling to do better. Uh, it's, not, it's not a destination that we arrive at. It is, it is a process of becoming, and especially those of us in white skin are going to continue to make mistakes and we are always going to be toiling to do better. 
Um, so one, one that came to mind though, was I was visiting a college in the Midwest and I had asked um, what was something that they really wanted to shift uh, with regards to DEI at their school. And the thing that kind of came up over and over again was they really wanted to recruit athletes of color. And especially they wanted to target sports that traditionally did not have athletes of color. And uh, so I asked, you know, well, okay, so what have you done so far to reach out to uh, you know, more diverse communities? And there's a lot of blank stares. And, uh, okay, um, well, what about um, team culture, department culture? You know, what about your, your university, the, the town? Like, are, you know, have you identified things that, you know, things that might need to shift so that, that you know, athletes of color might feel more, um, more included in the community, you know, um, blank stares. Okay. You know, so I'm starting to get irritated. So I'm like, why do you want to increase <laughs> diversity? <laughs> like, I mean, um, blank stares. And, you know, so <clears throat> I was like, okay, I'm gonna take another tact. Has anyone on this staff you know, done a good job of recruiting student athletes of color. And um, an African-American man in the back raised his hand. And I asked him if he had any advice for the group. And he proceeded to share a number of things that he does when he's communicating with athletes of color, with families, um, you know, where he goes to recruit, how he looks at a lot of spaces that a lot of coaches don't look at. Um, how he reaches out to his athletes, how he treats them once they're on the team, how he stays connected to families, what he does to be uh, intentional about the kind of culture and community he sets up with, within his team. We, we often think of the culture of a team as like something we just walk into, but we, the coaches, um, play a significant role in how that culture is created and sustained. And so he, you know, he's saying all these things, coaches are frantically writing things down and, uh, you know, I asked him, I said, oh, you know, oh my goodness, this is it's wonderful. Everyone seems to be getting quite a bit out of this. You know, how long have you been at the university? 25 years. So, you know, here's a coach who'd been at the university for most of his career. He recruited many athletes of color. He was a person of color himself and no one had ever asked him how they might do better or if he had advice or, you know, and I remember saying, you know, he's, he's recruited athletes of color and he himself is, is African-American and everyone kind of was like, oh, black. Like, he knows, trust me, where we are right here in the U S he's aware. <laughs> like, I mean, it, it was as if, you know, in this, this, uh, this idea of I will be colorblind, I won't even see you. I won't even see your athletes. I won't even, um, you know, and I, I know the compulsion to say, I won't see color, I won't see gender, I won't see. That's, it's the wrong, it's the wrong direction because that means you don't see me, you know, or you don't see this, this person because that person has um, an experience, a history, and and no, being being a woman is not a monolithic experience. Being African American is not a monolithic experience. No one person can tell the story of all people of, of any identity they represent. Um, but you know, to to hold our hand over our eyes um, when there are people all around us who can really enhance our understanding and awareness and. No, it is not always the work of a person of color to, to educate, um, especially in predominantly white spaces, you know, um, how to be different, how to do better. Um, uh, but there, there's also opportunities um, that we overlook in this idea of I'll just be colorblind or gender blind or those things. Um, and so, you know, I, I share that story. I, I remember thinking how how funny and sad, right? So many mm -hmm. of these are both funny and sad to me. Yes. Yeah, Jenny, Dr. Withikong, thank you for that. Um, I'm going to distill that down into this, and everyone can still it from me. Diversity without inclusion is tokenism. And that's, that's an example of a don't. 
just because you might have one person of color or someone with different sexual orientation, it doesn't mean that you're actually being inclusive. Uh, I've experienced that as the inclusion manager for US Rowing and living here in Pittsburgh and not one Pittsburgh Rowing Club ever reaching out to me in my entire tenure as, as the inclusion manager for US Rowing. And so, yeah, so thank you for sharing that. Um, I'm gonna move on to Ingrid. Ingrid and I met under horrible circumstances of the death of Mr. George Floyd. We ended up uh, in a group of Lululemon, BIPOC Lululemon ambassadors. And within that group is some powerful DE&I uh, ambassadors, which is pretty cool. Just letting you know, Jenny Bassa, this group is powerful. Um, and so, um, I was dying to work with Ingrid in some aspect and she said yes to this. After saying yes to a major position in Canada that I'll let you just go off mute for a moment and just say, what did you just walk into today for your first day of work? Thank you, Richard. So today is my first day at Walmart Canada's head of DI for 100,000 employees. So, and part of the global team. So a uh, huge opportunity and and one that I think my team is ready to roll up our sleeves. So looking forward to it. Thank you. Great. So I'm not going to not do your bio because we're inclusive on this webinar. <laughs> so Ingrid Wilson is an accomplished senior executive with almost 30 years of experience in corporate human resources, board and business strategy. She has organizational experience with, with non-for-profit, public sector, private and public companies in regulatory environments with global expertise, working for organizations with diverse operations, including the US and Europe. She has expertise in diversity, equity, inclusion and systemic racism, developing and executing on organizational strategies to foster an inclusive work environment and communities. Ingrid also currently volunteers as a mentor with black men Mentorship Inc. and Sheridan College. Ingrid also serves on the HR Advisory Group, Rotman School of Management, and the HRPA nominating and appeal board committees. And she presently uh, is living in Canada. So we are quite the global panel today. And so, Ingrid, in, in your years as a senior executive and as a strategic diversity, equity, and inclusion advisor, what two things stand out the most for you that is a common don't when attempting to create a diverse and inclusive organization? Thanks, Richard. Well, the first thing is don't make assumptions, right? Do not make assumptions. And second thing is always be open to learning and understanding because if you embed and make those assumptions, you're starting from the wrong place, right? So you need to look around, start from where you are, start from where the organization is and move forward. So don't assume because another group is doing it one way, that's the way it's gonna work for you, right? And with so many people not declaring um, and still covering within organizations because they're afraid to show who they are. You know, my, my father is Syrian and so I, I have a black Syrian mix and which I'm very proud of. But, you know, for me growing up, wherever we, we moved to in, in the black communities, it was always, oh, you get roles because you're light skinned and you have good hair, right? And that came from my own community, the black community. So, you know, don't, don't assume, don't assume that somebody's not working hard, don't assume that just because somebody's in a in a white identified body or a black identified body that there's no intersectionality so really really important so yeah ingrid i i really like that i i love starting my presentations with don't ever assume that we all have the same lived experiences so even coming from that space the the, the to walk up to someone and say, so what college did you go to? Right? Yep. As, as you may think that's nothing, but 
Um, there's a possibility that they did not, and there's lots of reasons that they may not have gone to college. And so we should not assume that we have the same lived experiences. Can you, uh, as you listen to Dr. Withycombe talk about her funniest don't and not so funny don't, do you have anything that comes to mind? Yeah, I'm gonna talk about the hair, okay? Mm -hmm. So, <laughs> yeah, so, you know, here, here in Canada, um, you know, my last corporate role for many, many years was insurance, which is a very structured, um, middle-aged, white um, environment. And it took a lot for me to climb the ladder and it was because I had two gentlemen, two CEOs who were white identified, who decided to sponsor me, right? But I still had the PIAs, I called them, prove it again, prove it again, the prove it again. And we had a new CEO who came in from Quebec, which is where I'm actually sitting today. And very, very structured, boxy individual, you know, made a lot of assumptions about race, color. Um, LGBTQ plus was a real issue for him you know, remarks like, ooh, that person is wearing a gay shirt. And I'd have to kind of, oh, let me talk to you in the office here. And one day I walked into the office and I'd straighten my hair, which I rarely do. And after he walked past me a couple of times and recognized, wait, that's really Ingrid. He took a picture and then proceeded to share it by email and attach it and shared it with this organization with don't you think English hair looks better this way, right? And some people thought it was funny. And, you know, I, I kind of dealt with it as, as the norm that, you know, let me, let me teach you about my hair. Like, am I making comments about yours? So, so you know, I, I use the humor in it about, you know, how much work it is for my hair, my curly hair to make it straight, et cetera. So there was a little bit of humor, but at the end of it, he got, so you're saying that I really shouldn't make those comments. He said, well, first of all, don't ask um, people of color to touch their hair, especially the women, because that's also a harassment problem I'm gonna have to deal with. But why does it matter if my hair is curly or straight? Your hair is your hair as well, right? So, so and, and that shifted him to a point where he would, he would ask, so Ingrid, so somebody said this to me, can I respond this way? What would you do to me? I said, well, if you respond that way, I'm gonna fire you. And if you respond this way, then we have a better conversation. But you know, it was it, watching a CEO shift like that is took a lot of work and a lot of humor and a lot of patience, repeating a lot of things. So that's a challenge. Yeah, so thank you for that. So I'm, you know that I'm in HR also with the city of Pittsburgh. And so we understand that that's an harassment yeah. to touch someone's hair for starters, but in general in society, that's also a microaggression. And I find that we step in it most on the docks and rowing because of those microaggressions of not being, uh, not understanding inclusive language and not understanding of not being culturally, racially or culturally literate. Uh, and so as we begin to go into our questions and answers after Jenny Bossa, uh, I, I hope that we can address some of those don'ts, uh, not only around the docks, but if you're doing it around the docks in the boathouse, you're probably doing it in the retail shop. You're probably doing it to your barista, you're, you're doing it in your workplace. Uh, and so this conversation, you know, when we talk about uh, diversity, equity, inclusion, and I always like to throw in belonging, the, it, it is first driven by you as an individual in self-reflection. And where do you fit into this space? And, and then it spreads beyond that. So thank you very much for that, Ingrid, and your hair looks lovely today. Thank you. A lot of gray, though. A lot of gray. <laughs> Great. Well, Jenny Bassa, last but not least, uh, a person that's become a colleague and a friend to me because of my relationship as a Lululemon ambassador that I'm proud to say that I'm a brand ambassador. Um, 
and also because of the death of Mr. George Floyd, uh, where I was given space to be able to use my 18 years in diversity, equity, and inclusion uh, to help train uh, Lululemon employees. And, and before we go on, uh, any opinion that we have is not the opinion of our organizations, is not the opinion of US rowing. It's our opinion and our perspective and our expertise. We, we are the Shmees, we're the subject matter experts uh, in this area. Uh, we'll talk in general, uh, but is in no way an opinion of the organizations that we represent or volunteer for. So Jenny Bossa is a director of IDEA, partnering for the Americas and Global Guest Innovation at Lululemon. How long is your business card? IDEA stands for Inclusion, Diversity, Equity, and Action. At Lululemon, Jenny is responsible for executing the mission and strategy of IDEA to, to well over 3,000 employees across North America. She has worked for Lululemon for over a decade and has a background in mental health and trauma-informed wellness. She is, committed, she is a committed teacher, provider, and influencer. She seeks out complicated problems and thrives on finding ease and simplicity in them. She believes the human experience is what connects us and drives us to change the world. She is a mother of two girls, a former lightweight rower in Coxon, and currently resides in Chicago, Illinois, USA. So uh, I can remember that Jenny and I bonded immediately when she saw a rowing background on one of our calls. And, and But I never got out of you, Jenny. Where did you row and where did you cox? Ooh, you're so funny. I'm like, that's my first question. This is great. Thanks for having me. <laughs> <laughs> Give me these questions. Um, I was a rower in um, Cleveland, Ohio. So for a school called John Carroll University, it was a club um, university. So that's the first place I started rowing. And then I actually moved to Boston. And um, the Charles is there. And I, when I shifted from lightweight rowing to coxing, um, and learn how to steer the Charles. As you know, what I discovered really quickly is word gets out if you're like a contract coxswain that knows that river. And so for seven years that I was living there around headed Charles time, I would get that call like, you available? You available? So I got the privilege to steer uh, any kind of boat you can think of, men, women, mixed. Like it was just a really cool um, experience. And I don't row currently. There's not, it's not in my repertoire right now. I really think. I feel like these ergs are like trending now and I have like flashbacks to like, like oh my gosh, <laughs> what? this is like people are wanting to do this and like yes. 5 p.m. comes to me and like, it's an erg test day. Yes, ergs are no longer in society punishment. Oh, they're trending. It, it's a lifestyle exercise equipment. It's so yeah. cool. So thank you. Thank you for sharing that. Um, <clears throat> So as we think about our rowing programs, and there's thousands of them th throughout the USA, uh, many of them are going to, are, are really passionate about going from a exclusively white rowing program or exclusively male rowing program, so non-diverse and inclusive organization, to wanting to become more diverse and inclusive. What are, what, what are the challenges to go from zero to what next? I mean, there's lots, but I, I think from my experience, the biggest challenge that anyone like individually or organizationally has is actually whatever perceived success you've had. So whether that's an organization like a corporate organization or a rowing club or an individual looking at how you're navigating your friendships and your relationships, like whatever got you there, that voted some perception of success for you. And so you're tending to like go there again. And that's where you're like, well, why should I shift and change for a company that might look like, well, I'm getting the ROI. I'm like meeting my targets. I'm meeting my goals for your friend group. Like we all get along, you know, there, there could be something that's like, why should I shift? So I was listening to Dr. Rithcomb when you were sharing, you said something about like in your story, you said, why do you want to, like, why do you want to track? So I think that's something to look at is like, starting to look at what's the reason for the shift and the change. And is it just the moment in time? And maybe it is, maybe there's some truth to that and say, and then what? What's more after that? So that there's some sustainment in there and there's some really like deep buy-in because there could be a lot of reasons why you wanna shift whatever the makeup of your organization is now. And there's lots of research as to what it does and what you can do. But as the individuals that are in it, if you don't see 
the reason for change, there won't be sustainment and there won't be, there won't, it won't feel real. Yeah, thank you for that, Jenny. I, I like to call in this idea is that if I'm the smartest person in the room, I'm in the wrong room. And what I find happening in our rowing community is that they think they have to do it. But what if you hire experts? What if you bought in community members who are already doing this work? What if you collaborated and partnered with people who are already doing the work? or bartered with a diversity, equity, inclusion consultant to give them a membership to the club to help look at their, their gap assessment, diversity gap assessment. And so you don't, you're not in it alone. You don't have to do it. And again, you can quote me and steal this. If you're the smartest person in the room, you're in the wrong room. And so we're gonna shift to questions and answers from the audience and the participants. There's a couple of questions in that, uh, already in the question and answer, and I'll call to that for a moment. But let's take a break. Let's take a deep breath. And Doc, Dr. Withycomb was texting me and saying, it's 114 degrees here, and we don't have air conditioning. And so I want to see if she's the biggest, she's the most op heat oppressed person on the call today. So in the chat, what city are you in and what is your temperature? Three, two, one, go. Can you beat 114? We got 101 in LA, Massachusetts 91, Denver, Boston 104, 107 Seattle, 82 Jackson Hole, Jackson Hole's in the spring, Sarasota 73, Pittsburgh, you know it, 90s. New York City, 95. 93, Rochester. Madison, 81. San Diego, 84. Dr. Withycomb, you're winning. Richmond, 90. Oh, Arizona, 106. Houston, 73. Whoa. Cold front. San Diego, 80s. Madison, 79. Atlanta, La Jolla, 68. Whoa, 68 degrees, La Jolla, California. Sheila, that's amazing. All right. Well, someone says that Pittsburgh can't beat West Coast right now. <laughs> and in Pittsburgh, we know to have air conditioners. <laughs> so thank you all who played the game. Uh, Peter Figgins, hello, Peter Figgins. It's still coming in. And so in the question and answer, the only question in the question and answer right now, and I hope you start bringing them in, um, Dr. Withicom was typing an answer, but we'll bring it up to the group. It's an anonymous question. How do you ask a BIPOC person for inclusion help in a way that doesn't come off as, as virtue signaling? That's a great question. So Dr. Withicom, since you were about to answer that, go right ahead. Well, uh, I uh, I think you know what I was what I was typing up was was essentially to to be really transparent. Um, I think you know um, webinars like this can be a great way to start conversations. So you know um, I, I had a lot of people when I would do DEI work with colleges who were nervous about bringing up DEI in, in different organizational um, capacities, and they said, "Well, use me as the excuse then." Say so you you. Say you were forced to attend a webinar. If that if that feels like you're in, um, I think you know I really love what Ingrid said about you know you, you are your organization is where your organization is, and that's where you've got to start. Um, and so you know saying you know after I attended this webinar, I got to thinking about shifting my own personal practice, club practice, um, own it. If it's the first time you've ever considered it, own that. I, I'm embarrassed I didn't think about it before. I wish I had thought about it before. Um, own that desire to do and be better, um, but also offer the option because again, it is not um, it is not the responsibility of the one or the two people of color in your club to do the emotional labor of, of bringing DEI to the forefront. And so saying, you know, if you would be willing, I would really love to know your thoughts about creating more inclusive spaces in you know, boathouse, things like that. I think that can be really, really powerful. And it's, it is a vulnerable place. 
Um, but what I have been told many times is the transparency is much more appreciated than um, just kind of bulldozing in. Yeah, thank you. Ingrid or Jenny, do you want to add to what Dr. Withicombe just said? Well, you don't have to. Um, so so I, I'm just going to add that, you know, it, it's just really important to step back and start from a place of, of respect and, and slow down. Because one of the things we've seen over the last year is, hey, you're a black person. You tell me what's going on. Explain to me why this is affecting you like that. And, and I love um, this book by uh, Mary Frances Winters um, that I read in the last year. And she says, start from a place of common ground. I'm gonna ask somebody that question. Don't be aggressive, you know, Ask them if you want to join me for a coffee, you know, talk about your history, their history and start building, but don't just wade right in and, and ask those type of questions. It's, it's sharing, learning and, and an openness to creating real relationships. You know, for me as an endurance runner, that's how I saw it come through because we've got such a diverse group of people running and there's a lot of unconscious bias there, but eventually you build respect and you start asking those questions. So. That's, that's amazing. Thank you for that, Ingrid. Um, one of the things that I want to call out, and I appreciate the anonymous person's that question, uh, those of us on this panel, we signed up for you to ask us these questions. That I want you to ask me these questions, but not every person that look like me could give a flying ham sandwich about you and your question. And so it's, it's a question of what type of relationship do you have with them? Have that person been able to show up at work or at the boathouse or wherever and be themselves? Do you know that to be true? Are they authentic or are they code switching because they are being asked to be something that they're not? And so you have to understand your audience before you, um, be, before you um, ask the question. Someone had a question for me. They wanted me to elaborate about being culturally and racially literate. Uh, there, there was actually an incident that I got an email from today from a boathouse. And I, I'm, we're, here, we're not here to solve your boathouse problems today, uh, but we will actually have uh, in the future, I plan on having uh, rowing programs that are successful with DEI and rowing programs that fail miserably. So we will be having those conversations in the future, as well as college programs that figured out how to become more diverse and inclusive within the community, if not within the campus. So look to those for the fall and the rest of the summer. But to answer your question, so the, the situation happened where uh, a learn to row is starting on uh, at a boathouse and three African Americans signed up very specific African Americans and those African Americans uh, like all members were asked to send a picture of their medical card that they had their COVID shot. And so for most people that might then you might say, okay, cool, I'll do that. But African Americans have a long history of mistrust with the medical field. Uh, to the point where we may not go get the COVID shot because there's been so much testing done on African Americans and indigenous people throughout the country. Basically, they call that medical apartheid. And, and so if you are racially literate or culturally literate, you know these type of things about your audience so that you don't step in it and that a person so that your participant does not become a victim of microaggression or maybe even uh, uh, oppression. So that's what I mean by being racially literate. There's a program on Netflix called High on the Hog. And it's the history of African-American foods throughout the United States. Red meat came from African-Americans. Cowboys came from African Americans. You that's becoming culturally literate. And so watch programs that you normally would not watch, read things that you normally would not read. It's not up to your 
um, participants that are different than you to give you that education is up to you to be proactive to get that education. Um, I hope that answers your question. Um, and and, and uh, Sam, do you want people to come off mic since you figured out how to do it? Or do you want to stay this format? And you can either chat. This format's, with... format's good. Have you gone through, address all the questions in the chat? I'm, I'm going to the next one now. Uh, good afternoon. Get it. Get it. A question from a youth athlete. What strategies are being done to promote safety for queer and trans athletes, especially in the current hate legislation period? And so no one on this call can speak to what's happening with US rowing. Uh, but if in general, uh, either any of you, Ingrid has her hand up. Oh, Jenny's hand is going up. Dr. Withycombe's hand. Yes, yes. So first Ingrid and then Dr. Withycombe. Uh, so I was actually typing a response to that and because it's such a great question. And, you know, unfortunately, there's not a good response. Uh, it, it's, we are so far off from dealing with this situation. Um, you know, I, I'd like to say that this individual should make sure they do their, their, um, their investigation before they join this group, um, the school, athletic, wherever it is to see if there is any welcoming for the transgender or the LGBTQ plus or queer community, because the challenge is that there's not a lot of work being done here. There's, there's issues with washrooms and then there's issues with safety if there's a, a non-gender washroom created or um, for transgender can I go to the washroom if I'm if I'm identified? How are they going to treat me? So, um, this is is one of the issues that is at the bottom of the rung with with Indigenous peoples. Um, we just haven't thought it through. We we are ignoring these groups of people and basically are more comfortable with them covering and not showing themselves in those types of spaces. So, you know, it's gonna take a lot to shift this one. Thank you for that, Ingrid. Thank you for the young person that asked that very brave question. Uh, Dr. Withicom, would you like to address that question? I can say that, um, uh, you know, that's something that we've talked about in, I'm on the US Rowings um, DEI uh, panel and uh, not this, the, Sorry. Committee. Committee. <laughs> that word. Um, it's not even that late here. It's the heat. It's the heat. Um, <laughs> I, um, no, I, I, that has come up with the committee. So, so something that I brought up is, you know, just what you said, the legislation that's coming through, and yet we're going to go host a junior event in Florida. Well, you know, I, that what is happening there? If we're saying that we're an inclusive space and then I'm part of this DEI committee, then how are we hosting an event in Florida that's passing a law around you know banning transgender athletes from participation? And you know, the one of the toughest things is of course everything is is very nuanced about you know where US rowing maybe has you know race courses or things like that. So that's something that a group of us are coming together and saying, how do we take a stand? Um, because for me, and this is a this is a do, or I guess a don't. It's a kind of a do and a don't. Whatever you say, do it. You know, don't don't put anything out there that you're not going to follow through with. So if you're going to have a mission statement that's inclusive of diversity and inclusion, then show action. Because there is nothing more frustrating from you know, I'll just speak from my perspective. I've worked for a lot of organizations over the years, um, and with a lot of sport organizations that are using it just because, uh, and someone else brought this question up too, it's trendy, it's what we should be talking about, it's supposed to be in our mission, it kind of comes back to that, the story I told about, you know, why, why are you increasing diversity and inclusion, because if you don't have a why, you're doing it to check the box, and everyone knows that, and it's going to be felt regardless of whether you intend it to or not, so that's definitely something that we're working on, and then one other piece that, that I try to do, and I try to communicate a lot with other 
school districts is we have some pretty robust um, LGBTQ plus inclusion um, policies and protocols in place at the school district level K-12 and also uh, in our athletics programs. And we really try to share those out. We're part of um, an urban wellness coalition. So, you know, um, large urban centers all over the United States. And we try to share our, our policies and how we go about getting those kinds of policies passed. Because um, yes, in, in Portland, Oregon, maybe we didn't face a lot of resistance passing a policy um, that allows transgender athletes to participate on the team with which they identify, full stop. Um, but in other, in other cities and other urban centers that might be problematic for them. So how do we help them navigate those systems? So that's something that, that you know, I try to do personally and we try to do that for, for a lot of the different organizations we work with. Um, so it's not a satisfying answer, but it's, it's a small step. And thank you for that, Jenny and Ingrid and the person again that asked the question. So there is some chat going on. Uh, they, people wanna know more do's and don'ts, but I want to pause on that for a moment because we also want to make sure that people's voices are being heard with the questions and answers. And so Ingrid and Jenny and Dr. Withicombe, when you answer questions, if you want to throw in, spin that into that don't or that do, that'll cover all of it. Uh, again, my friends, we can talk forever and break down microaggressions and racial literacy and this and that and those are all individual webinars uh, but we are going to go high level with this uh, there is a, another question for me and this is not the richard butler show but when you step in it step out of it by apologizing the question was what happens when we do step in it you're going to step in it and I've been stepping in it since we now have new pronouns and I apologize and I learn and then I make it a point to go educate myself. I, I have to educate myself on our Asian Americans history in America. Most recently, I had to go educate myself on indigenous people in Canada and USA. Uh, I made it a point to educate myself once I step in it, once I apologize. And so, yes, be graceful, have grace for yourself and the person that you may have uh, made a victim to what you did not know. Um, um, so, um, yeah, so thank you for that. So someone is calling me in for not calling the two Jennies Jennies. It's just a distinction that one, there's two Jennies. So yeah, two Jennies, uh, Dr. Withicombe and Jenny Bossa, do you have an issue with me? Dr. Withicombe, do you have me or have a problem with me not calling you Jenny? No, but I think um, if I'm understanding that question correctly is why are you referring to me as doctor um but but the others by their first name i'm okay just being jenny w yeah i it's more uh, of course you i know you and it's besides the respect for you we have two jennies on the call that's that's all so um thank you for that call in and if you don't know me we don't call people out we call them in and we raise them up so thank you for that um so next question. And so, and by the way, Terry, Edwin, Galvin, I'm sorry if that bothered you. Can I actually throw in two cents? Richard, yes. I, I saw somebody ask a question about when should you start teaching about- I was about to ask that question. Yeah, and, and, and personally, I, I think the question was, do you start grade 12 or peer city? So we, we all, unconscious bias comes from our lived stories, our culture, how we grow up, what we bring from our houses to our workspaces every day. So if you don't start teaching children as young people, waiting until high school is too late. They've already started bringing those embedded thoughts with them. So me personally in the running space, my niche for, for young people is for age four to nine, because 
I know that's a space that we can feel confidence and make a difference. And, and we're teaching them to be a community, black, white, whatever. They're all running, boys, girls, they're all, they're all running together and focused on running and collaboration and building confidence. And they take that with them out to school starting at age four. It's, it's a different process. So if you wait until grade 12, later on in high school, there's too many embedded um, decisions made already that they're bringing from their lived experiences. So. Good, I love that you said that. I, I wanted to double down on that. And I think that's probably a do is that um, this is where our education started. My partner and I, we have a three and a six year old and we we're actually living in Portland in the time and the local library had a course that's, that was um, talking about race with your preschoolers. And that's where we learned that um, racial bias starts from age three to five. And that's really when they start noticing and like looking at their caretakers, looking at representation. So one of the first things we did was like, we did an audit of all our books. Like what was the representation that we were unconsciously looking at? Who is the heroine? What were the stereotypes in these books? And like really looking and then doing it for music and then doing it in our own, like our own collection of who are the authors that we've been influenced by. And then no wonder as adults, do we have a hard time like breaking out of some of these things that have been ingrained within us? So I 100% agree with you. It's never too early because for folks with lived experience, this is the world they're growing up in. And it's our really our responsibility to, to point it out. And then it becomes something that's just not a it's it's my my kids are like, how was racism today, mama? Like in the like in the dinner table, because we talk to them about what I do for a living and what's happening and you know, in a way that they understand and it's a way that actually as an adult, if we can explain it, most of the times when we trip up on our words, it's because we haven't, I haven't had. Like me and my partner haven't had the conversation. We haven't realized like, where do we stand with this? What, what would we say to a peer group? Then if that's a big signal to us that we haven't actually done the work. Thank you, Jenny. And Dr. Jenny Lynn with Ecom, do you, since you're a subject matter expert with education, do you wanna weigh in or do you want us to move on to the next question? I, I think everybody has has covered exactly what I would what I would share. I know that um, there was uh, uh, Terry Galvin um, added um, how to how and when to introduce rowing to all children. Um, and as I can share that with the ERG Ed program, we've we've gone down to about fifth grade. It's really hard to go under fifth grade um, from a body mechanics perspective because the, the, especially on the rowing machines, they're pretty little, but I will just say that my, my little ones were on an ERG at age two is probably why they don't row now. Um, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> but I, I would say like with ERG ed, we try to really focus on middle school and high school with regards to rowing in, in particular. Um, that is the age at which we can partner with our youth rowing programs and get them out in the barge uh, in practice boats and things like that. So they're, they're usually at least tall enough um, uh, to, uh, you know, to, to navigate those, those well, but there's nothing wrong with getting them on herbs early. Um, there's a lot of really fun games that you can do on, on growing machines um, and with growing machines. There's a lot of great science, um, math, technology pieces you can weave into um, to the educational components. Um, so I, it, like any sport, as long as it's, when they're young, as long as it's fun and exciting, then, um, then it's, it's going to be exciting for them. Thank you, Dr. Jenny. So next question, what advice would you give to assistant coaches? And I'm going to phrase this with uh, managers as well. Try, so what advice would you give assistant coaches slash managers of organizations trying to make changes as it relates to DE&I, but they're not feeling supported or listened to by their head coaches? Uh, this often comes up in the level two training here at U.S. Rowing, and I will mark our time at 7.54, uh, which one of our panelists in general would like to speak about when you don't have leadership buy-in? Ooh. <laughs> 
I mean, with two minutes to go, Richard, no, but <laughs> I feel like I, I will give a little bit of an answer and then leave some space, but because I was staring at Terry Wiggins' um, question here too, was a little bit about um, like, what do you do when folks have emotional load? I think my question is, my answer might be collapsed in that, is that with d &I programs, I really would emphasize the, the emphasis on mental health with it. So I think a lot of folks, um, they're doing a lot of this work, they're coming up against opposition or like, you know, how do you keep that, keep that sustained energy? How do you keep it going? And that takes a lot off the coaches, the managers, and for the athletes that are carrying those emotional loads of like, whatever is happening in their lives, because there is a lot of and then so I would really encourage folks to look at what is the role of mental health in your DEI programs and what like, and maybe tying into the LGBT Q, Q, Q questions sorry, about that too is like, where is the support because we know it's, it's a long journey. And it, the mental health um, aspect of it can't be really like, you can't have enough of it for anyone on this spectrum of wherever you're entering into this conversation. So that's what I would offer as a do. Um, and I'll open up to my co-panelists, see if there's anything else there. It's, and so I'll, I can respond to that. If there's no leadership buy-in, it's a non-starter. And your answer to the, what's happening is to that non-starter of no leadership buy-in. Now, do you have enough respect and power within the organization as an assistant coach to lead the effort? And so you become proactive and you lead the effort in spite of buy-in because it may be the right thing for you to do. And Jenny Boss, I thank you for answering Terry Wiggins' question. Um, yeah, so the question is, so we start with a more inclusive statement. How do we enforce it? Uh, I, so who would like to respond to that? It's from Jen Bloomquist. I mean, Go ahead, Ingrid. If, it, if it's an inclusive statement, um, it's got to have something underneath it. I mean, yes. there's there's a lot of statements happening out there since um, May 25th and last year. And, and now a lot of companies who made those statements, their employees are starting to look around. Okay, we've got through um, the pandemic. We're, we're shifting through and you made a statement, what are you doing now? It's a year later, right? So, so people are starting to make decisions about organizations that have made those statements but haven't stepped up and what's underneath it. it you know, the, performa the performative allyship and, you know, today's a fairly significant day in the LGBTQ community because 52 years ago, the Stonewall riots is what started the gay pride parade and, and everything else. So I love the shifts that have happened in the, the pride flag this year to recognize the other intersectionalities, but um, it's more than just that flag. It's what's underneath it. Are you recognizing the intersectionalities of the transgender, the two transgender people of color who started this movement, right? And and how we move everything through. So I, I, would, I would not even put inclusive in front of this, the word statement if you don't have anything underneath it. It's, it's just a statement. So. Yeah, it should involve a st strategy for what the action steps will be within that statement. And so, you know, you just have to have action statements along with that. So we're really, I hate to do this, uh, maybe we should start, Sam, we should start having what we call after talk. So after we do the webinar, we spend 30 minutes having even a little more conversation with the people that want the conversation. And I'm naming that DEI after talk for the future. Uh, I will have Sam gather the um, questions 
in statements in the chat and in the questions and the ones we did not address, I'll send to the panelists and we will personally respond to those on your behalf. So thank you all uh, very much for being here. Thank you for the person that called me in. As I say, I always step in it and that's really cool. Uh, we're, we're all constantly learning and we, and we have to accept those things with grace, right? Uh, thank you, Jenny Bossa. Thank you, Dr. Jenny. Thank you, Ingrid Wilson. Thank you, U.S. Rowing for giving us this space monthly. Uh, this, I hope, was useful. Uh, there's a lot more do's and a lot more don'ts, but you just did this and you just did this. So thank you very much for uh, coming on to this webinar. Talk to you again next month. Thank you. Bye.